Okay. Good noon time, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming today to uh, see the 2018 Worcester Polytechnic Institute student final presentations of the projects that they've been working on here on the island for the last two months and uh, for two months before that preparing back on campus. We are in, I don't know, our 10th or 12th or 13th year here on Nantucket. It's always a wonderful experience for all of us, certainly the students. I'm Scott Justo, one of the two faculty advisors, along with my colleague Fred Luft, who've been here with the students. And uh, we are so appreciative of all of the organizations that have sponsored the six projects this year uh, and the uh, other uh, people in the community who welcome us every year. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to our first team that will be talking about the Nantucket building analysis that they've done. Each presentation will run about 20 minutes or so, and then there'll be uh, 10 minutes or so for a question and answer uh, discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, I would use the mic. Um, All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are the WPI project group working on a, we will completed a build out analysis of the island. Uh, we are working with uh, Ms. Rita Higgins, the select board member, Mr. Greg Tivenin, assistant town manager, and Mr. Andrew Vorst, director of planning. Now, WPI uh, Nantucket is a very special community. It has a rich history. It has a beautiful aesthetic that brings tourists for miles, but it is still a very uh, community that needs to plan for the future. All communities need a plan for growth of the future, for uh, all sorts of needs, electricity, um, sewerage, and all of the needs the town could uh, see in the future. So without further ado, uh, I'm James Heinemann. I'm Jonathan Barr. I'm Peter Durkin. My name is David Simpson. And that's good. Go on. So firstly, we have some uh, definitions, just in case you don't know what a build-out analysis is. Not everybody does. I definitely didn't. Um, but. A build-out analysis is a detailed study that projects a hypothetical number of future dwellings uh, subject to constraints. Uh, some of these constraints are zoning laws and use codes. And um, this project only considers residentially zoned parcels. This is very important to understand for our analysis, so we didn't go into commercial or anything like that. But um, this is important because most of the development that will occur is going to happen in residential zones. Um, we hope that this can be applied to the 2020-2021 master plan, which takes into account sewerage, electricity, potable water, and other town services. And um, yes. Uh, we'll go into the outline of what we're gonna be showing you this afternoon. Uh, we're gonna start by showing present day Nantucket. Before we do any analysis of the future, we have to look at what's already on Nantucket, what's already built out, um, so we can compare that to future projections. So we're going to go over basic definitions we're going to use throughout our project and background of Nantucket. Then we're going to get into our first scenario, a hypothetical maximum build-out. This is a the theoretical number of future dwellings that the island could see. Um, we're going to tell you how we came up to this number briefly, uh, where the building can occur, and uncertainties in our projects. Our project is not perfect. There are many ways it could be improved for the future. Then we get into our 2030 scenarios. So this is for a time period from now until 2030. We have a low and a high scenario that we came up with working with our sponsors in a focus group. Um, so projected dwelling count for 2030, high, low, recommendations for the future, how it could, that number could become more accurate, and how the analysis could be used as a tool to get it uh, as close as possible as the years go forth. And then applications for master planning, as we've stated. A few more definitions and caveats of the project. Uh, parcel. Is a tract of land that is owned by any entity, and it's taxed and it's recorded in the tax assessor data. A uh, dwelling unit is a home, um, and it's recognized as livable by the town. Residential is anything existing within residential parcels, so any dwelling unit or parcel in a uh, residential zone is residential. Um, a zone is an area of land having a set use and regulations. So zones have their own minimum lot sizes, which are very important in, uh, in our study. 
And ground cover is the total footprint of a, a building on a like on a parcel. So some people um, think that ground cover is like it has to do with wetlands, but it's actually just the total footprint of a, a dwelling on a parcel. Um, we we're looking to um, or we only did residential parcels, like I said before, and we didn't look into commercial or open space or any industrial zones. Um, and we used the most recent assessor data from the G and GIS data. Um, so now this is our master table, but we're going to get into every single category. So we're going to start by looking at present day, like we said before. So this is just present day Nantucket. <laughs> On the left side is the districts. Uh, we got 37 districts received to us uh, from the GIS Nathan Porter, Mr. <laughs> Mr. <G> <laughs> Mr. Nathan Porter from the GIS office. Um, there are 36 districts uh, defined by the Civic League. Um, this table shows the top 10 districts with all the other going in the other category, um, town being one district, Wisconsin, airport, and so forth. Uh, we looked at number of current residential parcels uh, divided into these districts. So there are 10,697 total parcels of land uh, divided into these districts, town having 4,000, and so forth. Then we looked at the number of total dwellings. We defined what dwelling was, number of dwellings, um, that's the main takeaway from our analysis of present-day Nantucket, uh, 10,456 current dwellings on the island and then divided into all the districts. Um, then we look at percentage of total dwelling in each district, town being the most, 40.9% of all dwellings are in the town district. Uh, you can see a small map on the bottom there defining the districts. Town, we uh, specifically determined town to be just the historic district and going down more to Mid Island, so it's a large, it's the largest district. Um, then we looked at parcels with one dwelling versus parcels with two dwellings. The main takeaway from this is there is 80% of dwellings on Nantucket of uh, parcels are have only one dwelling on the parcel, uh, so 20% have both single and uh, secondary dwelling. Um, by looking at this, uh, main takeaway is we determined a current ratio of 1.22 dwellings per parcel on Nantucket. So this is an analysis that we, um, we carried on into the future in our future projections using this 1.22 ratio, assuming this would stay the same, more so or less, into the future. Um, so this is our present day Nantucket, main takeaways, total dwellings, town has the most dwellings, uh, 1.22 dwelling per parcel ratio. All right, so now we're gonna get into our first scenario, which is our hypothetical maximum build out. An important thing to note here, um, what this means is this is um, the maximum amount of new dwellings Nantucket can have. This is completely hypothetical. This is very unlikely to occur. Um, so just keep that in mind as we're going through it. So this will be the second column on the table. So what we have is our districts, as James had just um, defined to you, everybody. Um, and then we have new dwellings, percent new dwellings, and per percent potential growth. So what the new dwellings um, state is this 5,461 is the number of maximum new dwellings across the entire island. What this means is that there would be a 52.2% growth of all dwellings um, as compared to right now. The, um, for example, town has two th would have 2,610 of these new dwellings. That would account for 47.8% of, of that 5,000 number. Um, we also included a blown up map using our GIS software to show you guys what parcels are eligible for this development. Um, town, um, as a district, would see a 61% total um, potential growth. Again, this is just potential. This is not going to happen, but this is um, a tool so that we can see where development is possible. Similarly, for Sconset, we have a map that shows the 598 potential dwellings that could go on these parcels in the Sconset area. That would account for 11% of this new build out. What's important to note here is that this 107.9% means that the dwellings that are currently in Sconset with this new maximum build-out will double and then some in size. 
So the three types of parcels that you saw on each of our map, um, the first one being an undeveloped parcel. This is a parcel that has no current dwelling and has the potential for both subdivision, primary, and secondary dwellings. So as you can see on this um, Google Images overlay with our ArcGIS program, we have an um, undeveloped uh, parcel here. There's no dwelling currently on it, has no ground cover on it, um, but it can, it does have the potential for um, dwellings to be put on it. The table off to the left is affected residential parcels. That's the number of undeveloped parcels that we came up with for our map that we'll show in a few slides. Um, taking into account that all of these parcels go through both subdivision and primary and secondary um, dwellings, we'll come out to four, uh, 1,463 maximum dwellings for this type of parcel. The second type of parcel we have is a uh, secondary dwelling parcel. This is um, a parcel that has one dwelling currently, but has the potential for two. So there are 2,066 current uh, second, secondary dwelling eligible parcels. So that means there will be 2,066 maximum new, maximum new dwellings, since there'll just be one house on each of these new parcels, or one house added to each of these parcels. And the last type we have is our subdividable parcel. This is a parcel that's 2.5 times its minimum lot size and has ground cover available. And newly subdivided parcels can have both primary and secondary housing. So um, this parcel um, is noticeably larger than the other two as shown before. So it can be subdivided, it has a, a dwelling already on it, but it has the space for a secondary one. And from the table, there's 564 of these currently on the island. Um, if they're all subdivided and have the dwellings added, we'll get 1,932. All three of those add up to that 5,461 maximum dwellings on the island. And this is just a blow up of our map that we formulated um, using our ArcGIS software. So this is the entire island as a whole. We have the table up above. Um, there's a fairly even distribution of um, each type of parcel throughout the island. Um, the island can definitely go through a lot more development, but as I'd said before, this is all hypothetical. All of this build out is not going to happen. And then we just have a blow up of the Sconset um, district itself, which again, 598 new dwellings, and it shows each type of parcel currently that Sconset has, and how many dwellings can result from each of those parcels. So these are some uh, uncertainties that we had within our study. Um, firstly, being conserved areas and wetlands. Uh, wetlands are uh, very restrictive for development, so they can obviously create less. Uh, we, we didn't look into every single wetland on the island. We did go through a, few, a lot of them with uh, Cormac Collier and Andrew Bors and um, eliminated any wetlands that we had already identified, like, like parcels we identified it as developable. And if they had wetlands on them or like covering them, we um, eliminated them from our study. Secondly, we have other dwelling sources. There is potential for tertiary dwellings and accessory dwellings, tertiary being in residential, accessory being in commercial zones. Um, so this is gonna make our number bigger, but we didn't look into this because there have only been a few, uh, like 30 uh, tertiary dwellings in the past two years. Third, we have geometric restrictions. These are um, wetlands, or not wetlands, sorry. Um, Leach fields, uh, wells, and um, yeah, leach fields and wells. Some other, we had other uncertainties, but they're not as important. Um, and the total comes to negative 15 to a 10, positive 10% uncertainty. And we recommend that um, these be definitely looked further into in a future build out analysis because they can make it much more accurate. But we just didn't have the time to go into these. 
So you might be wondering, how do we use this number for short-term planning? The numbers we produce, that 5,400 number, is the maximum number of dwellings you can see. However, if we're looking at master planning, the master plan beginning in 2020 or 2021 and running for about a decade, that number is not going to happen within that 10-year span. So trying to figure out how to use this to apply to 2030, we decided to look at some historical trends in building permits. The graph up here is the number of single family dwelling permits the town issued between 2001 and 2018. As you can see, there's some highs from 2002 to 2007, and then the recession from 08 to 012 rather low, and in recent years has been slowly climbing. So one of the trends we looked at was the average number of trends. This was from our focus group, um, the low number that might have been expected to be seen. So as I just mentioned, there's 130 dwelling permits on average issued. However, looking at the most recent four years, you'll see that there's a slight upward trend. If we projected that trend forward, we deemed that this would be a rather high estimation of what could happen, but might still be fairly reasonable seeing the amount of growth that we're seeing. So what do those numbers look like in our table? If you look all the way to the right, we have those scenarios. So that first scenario, the low scenario, again, was the average. If we take the average net dwelling increase, so that includes other types of dwelling permits as well as demolition, you would see that there's 1,260 new dwellings that could be constructed between now and 2030. This represents a 12% increase on the current number of dwellings, and just for reference, would be a 14% increase in the town region. <coughs> that high scenario, which was the upward trend in the last four years, would result in nearly 2,500 new dwellings being built. This represents a 24, almost a quarter increase in the number of dwellings on Nantucket, and represents a 28% increase on the town. So the graph I'm showing you right now is kind of where Nantucket might go in the future. The red shows that low, the average scenario, whereas the blue shows that high scenario. So that low scenario, compared to the 5,400 dwellings that we project as the maximum, represents nearly a quarter of all development. While that's a large number, the steep comparison represents nearly half of all potential development that we, can, that we estimate can occur on Nantucket. Which of these is going to be more accurate? And that's the question we have to answer going forwards. The build-out analysis is currently designed as a tool that can be updated year after year to see where the town lies within these two boundaries so that way you can compare and see moving forward, do you like how growth is happening? Do you like the pace at which growth is happening? It kind of becomes a way to estimate and see where are you compared to the maximum. And um, so here we have our potential applications for the master plan. So as we had said before, the master plan um, plans for community development in fields such as sewerage, affordable housing, electricity, population growth, and amongst other things. And one of the applications that we applied our build-out analysis to as a tool was sewerage. So uh, this is our maximum build-out map that's overlaid with the different sewerage needs districts. Now these are districts that have um, that could have the need for new sewerage systems. Um, the bolded outlined areas are those um, <coughs> needs areas. And um, we do have a blow up of the Madiket and the South uh, Harbor region. So um, as you can see, we have our parcels eligible for development in each of these regions. Um, by calculating the number of p maximum dwellings that can result from all of these parcels and putting them into our 2030 low and high scenario, this can be used as a tool for the sewerage department to potentially plan for uh, new sewerage piping uh, in these specific regions and is just one of the different applications of the build-out analysis. Uh, so we'd like to thank you all for coming. We'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, anyone we've talked to, anyone we've interviews with, anyone we've had focus group with. It was a lot of work. Uh, we really enjoyed doing it. And we'd like to open the board to uh, comments and discussions. Thank you again. Any questions? Yes. yes. Uh, well, we looked at the secondary dwellings, but are you talking about increasing the footage of a building? Uh, no, uh, we did not look into that. That would fall under one of our other uncertainties. Mm -hmm. So we were here for about seven weeks. So while we looked into a lot of different factors, we couldn't look into everything. 
So for anyone who would be continuing to use the build out analysis as a tool, they would have to um, account for that more than more than we had got time to. I, um, I'm curious, I know you guys just looked at the Sure. So the question was, could we put together a number of how many dwellings were was completely unbuildable, whether it be conservation wetland, so on and so forth? We certainly could. Um, we know that the estimate of conservation land right now is 60% and growing. Um, the amount of wetlands, we, as we mentioned before, we went through and eliminated a lot of parcels that would be unavailable. Um, a final number we don't have, but we could certainly produce in our final reports. When you consider the potential for additional dwellings in sewer needs districts, did you consider or contrast um, uh, the number of additional dwellings that could be built if sewer were, were extended to those needs areas and if it were not? So the question was about the sewer areas, if there's any difference between uh, if there was or was not sewer, correct? That was the question? Yeah, what would the difference be if sewer were extended as opposed to so, so, so what we currently looked at was the current zoning uh, as, it, as it currently stands. So we were mentioned before looking at Matikit that we have the current zoning in all the areas and stuff for the parcels right now and that if sewer went in or something along those lines that, that could, the zoning could change because it could be smaller because you don't need the area for septic or wells. Um, so we didn't look into whether or not the zoning might change. That would be an interesting thought exercise to take that entire area and see if we change zoning in that area what might it look like? The, the build out analysis that we have currently has the ability to do that, but we did not take the time to do that. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, as I see this presentation, uh, I'm struck by the fact that it really is in a sense a preview of coming attractions with the uh, 2021 final you know, official build-out plan is going to go into detail and it's going to shrink those margins of uncertainty that you highlighted. We've got um, information here that uh, basically allows the town to address the such issues as the timing of certain kinds of capital investments. Like if we're going to do $50 million worth of sewer, ought we to do it here first and then have the second $50 million over there or vice versa? And it seems to me that just comparing the, the comparison that you made suggests that there's a whole lot more that could happen in one place than could happen in the other. And the other uh, aspect of this is that it provides, um, it, it, it kind of sets up the choices that the town and the voters have in terms of what they want to happen and how they want it to unfold and whether there are some limits that they want to enact. Uh, one way you can enact a limit is simply by not building the sewer, which some suburban communities do, and they say there's no sewer, and not much you can build to live in. Here, that's not so. But I wonder if you could elaborate on some of the strategic applications of these data once they get kind of refined and every single number is double checked to be sure it's correct as of 2021. So one of the abilities is, so the build out analysis as it currently stands is entirely on Excel. So we have the ability to uh, manipulate or change data. So we have a, a master save file. You'd be able to go through and change certain factors if you so choose. And hopefully I'm trying to create them in a way that it's you know easy. It's a click of a button to change. You know, Here's this area and you want to change it to be something else that you'd be able to do so. So while we don't have those current numbers, the idea is to leave behind a, a tool for the town to use, to manipulate, to see what the future does hold, to change some of our assumptions. Maybe they're no longer applicable in you know two years time even. So if we leave behind a clear, concrete, easy to use tool, that means that the life of a build out analysis you know, isn't gonna be just a one and done, here it is, leave it all up on the table, here's some numbers for you. If, that, if you can adjust, manipulate, and then 
still have some usable product at the end. That's the idea and the goal. Did that, did that answer the question? Okay. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? One more question? Yes. Um, in order to update this thing, you would say what sort of experience or skill level I can be able to plug in the numbers in the GIS files. I know I believe one comes out January 1st of every year. That'll have the updated parcel information, so on and so forth. The assessor data similarly comes out, I believe, January 1st of every year. Matching those two tables together does take some time. There are some crossover errors that you'd have to analyze, but we'd estimate knowing all the, the, the code that we've written for you know all the three types of parcels that we have and all the other restrictions, that just inputting those wouldn't be quite as time consuming as you know the seven weeks we spend trying to get this all together. So it wouldn't be anything restrictive as long as you know kind of basic Excel. And you, if you understand what you're looking at, it becomes a little more straightforward. And we're trying to put that into layman's terms and words rather than Excel code because it's not as pretty looking. But for certainly, it doesn't require the most in-depth knowledge or any sort of like computer science or anything. Okay, I want to uh, thank Build Out Team again. Hi everyone, thank you for coming out today. My name is Amy Bell. I'm a biotechnology major at WPI. My name is Cassie Grassa and I'm a civil engineering major. My name is Elizabeth Delmonico and I'm a computer science major. And we're here to talk to you about the 14 week project we completed with Housing Nantucket in order to expand one of their affordable housing programs. Now, I'm sure you all know how beautiful Nantucket is, and it's no surprise that everyone wants to be here, especially during the summertime. Unfortunately, the high demand for real estate has driven low and middle income residents to really struggle to find housing. I'm sure all of you know someone who has either experienced the Nantucket shuffle from property to property or just can't pay their mortgage every month. That's where Housing Nantucket comes in. Housing Nantucket has been helping the community since 1999, 94. Um, they are a nonprofit focused on providing affordable home opportunities for low to middle income residents. They offer four different from home buyer and rebuilding your credit classes. These are available to anybody living on Nantucket and they're free. They fulfill the requirements of the soft second, mass housing, and FHA loans. They also have a program called house recycling, and this is where they will take a small home, usually less than 22 feet wide and less than two stories, and they will move it from one property to one of their other properties. And a lot of their affordable rentals have actually been moved from private properties onto new ones. And then lastly, they have the Covenant Program. So the Covenant Program um, offers a permanently affordable promise that's secured in the deed and our project is focused on this specific program, and I'm gonna talk more about it in the next slide. So what is the Covenant Program? The Co Covenant Program allows a property owner with multiple residential dwellings to sell one of those dwellings at a permanently affordable price. It also allows a property owner to sell the developmental rights on part of their parcel of their property. So this provides home ownership opportunities for low to middle income residents and sellers actually have the opportunity to choose the buyer. And the buyer has um, multiple requirements that they must meet. And one of those requirements is that they have to have under 150% of the median annual income. And the sale and resale of all coveted homes are subject to a price cap that is determined by the Department of Housing and Urban Development and current interest rates. And this price cap resets every year in January. And in the Covenant program, they have two sub-programs. Their first one is the condo lot program. So for example, we have this picture on the screen. It's not a Covenant home, but it's a perfect example of what could happen. So under the condo lot program, it allows the separate ownership of a primary and secondary dwelling on a single lot. And under the secondary lot program, the, it allows the splitting of a property and it results in the separate ownership of two different lots. 
So even though 83 Covenant homes have been created to date, there is still room for growth. They've housed hundreds of Nantucket's families, business owners, and public servants, but demand is higher than ever. There are currently 60 people interested in buying a Covenant home and none of them are on the market. That's why Housing Nantucket has set the goal to have 100 Covenant homes by the end of 2020, and we're here to help them realize that goal. Now, I know that can mean a lot of things, but in this case, it means helping them expand their marketing of this program. So here's the mission statement of our project, which reads, the goal of this project was to help Housing Nantucket expand their Covenant housing program by targeting potential sellers through the analysis and development of marketing materials. And below are our five objectives, which there's a brief summary of them up here, and we're going to be going into more detail on them in the next several slides. So for our first objective, we determined potential supply of Covenant homes and analyzed past transaction data. So in terms of potential supply, out of the thousands of properties on the island, we worked with the TMO IQP group who just presented and Bernadette Meyer to find that there are around 400 properties on the island that have covenant housing potential. These properties are shown in blue on the map. And covenant housing potential means that the property either has multiple dwellings, such as a guest house or a cottage, or there's enough land on the property to be split according to the zoning regulations. And you may notice that some of the properties in blue are along the waterfront. While these properties do qualify for the Covenant Housing Program, they probably will not end up selling into the Covenant Housing. And you may, sorry, from our analysis of the past transaction data, we found that most of these took place in the Mid-Island region, which is shown in zoomed in of the map. And as you can see, there's still plenty of room for growth with all of the blue lots still shown here. And another takeaway we got from our past transaction analysis was that streets with other covenant homes on them, on them are more likely to sell. So this is why it's beneficial that there are many clusters of blue still here, because if we can get one person on one of these streets to sell, then there was a more likely chance for others to sell into the program. All right, so our second objective was to develop consumer profiles of past sellers. Now, what is a consumer profile? It's basically a snapshot into who sells Covenant. They include important information like demographics, reasons for selling, and information about the property they sold. We grouped our profiles based around categories or trends that emerged in our research. For example, we created a profile based around who sells into the secondary lot program. And we also created a separate one for who sells to somebody they already knew. Some of the top takeaways from these profiles were 91% of sellers in the past five years were year-round residents. Another takeaway is of all sellers in the past five years, 28% of them sold for financial reasons. And in the past five years, the median sale price of a covenant property with a dwelling on it was $500,000. So to help us make these consumer profiles, these seller profiles, we had to interview past sellers and local real estate agents. To do that, we looked through the past transaction data and we picked out um, all of the past sellers from the last five years and we sent emails asking if they would like to participate. We were able to interview seven past sellers and four local real estate agents and we got a lot of important insight into how the program was and how their process went. So from that, after we finished all of the interviews, we came up with interview takeaways after we compiled all of the information we got. And from those, we got uh, reasons for selling, common concerns, and important insights. So for the top reasons that sellers sold, the first and largest one was for a financial investment. Either they needed money for different various reasons, for children if they were going off to college or anything else. They needed to lower their mortgage to stay in their home. We found that that was a big driving point. A lot of Nantucket residents want to stay in their home. They love it, but sometimes they just can't afford their monthly mortgage. And they, or they needed to divide their assets. Whether they were going through a separation, business, or personal, they needed to divide their asset quickly. 
The second reason was that they had unused land or dwelling that they just didn't want to take care of anymore. It was becoming a burden. Or once again, it went into financial investment. They needed the money, so they sold off part of their parcel or another dwelling. And then the third reason was that they wanted to provide housing for employees or they no longer wanted to be a landlord. So for our third objective, we created a mailing list for Housing Nantucket's marketing materials. This mailing list consists of the 400 properties we talked about earlier that have covenant housing potential on the island. And our mailing list includes the Nantucket address of the property as well as the mailing address in case the resident is seasonal and isn't here year round. And we also included if the street has other covenant homes on it because we mentioned earlier that those streets would be more likely to sell into the program. And this is a very valuable deliverable for our sponsor because now they will be able to directly target potential sellers on the island by sending them mail such as postcards and knowing that that property is eligible for the program. And the mailing list is in the form of an Excel spreadsheet so that once we leave, Housing Nantucket will still be able to make edits to it, add new properties, etc. All right, so our fourth objective was to evaluate uh, Housing Nantucket's past effectiveness in marketing the Covenant program. To do this, we performed what is called a SWOT analysis, and a SWOT analysis is a fairly straightforward way of looking at basically anything. You categorize it by its strengths, weaknesses, and then you look for any opportunities or threats that might present itself to it. So. In the case of Housing Nantucket and the Covenant program, we specifically looked at their online marketing. The full analysis is a little bit too long to share with you today, but we have some of the biggest takeaways on the screen here. So for strengths, we found that Housing Nantucket's branding and mission was clear across almost all of their marketing materials. They had consistent, a consistent color scheme, and you had no question about who they were and what they stood for. Some of the weaknesses we found were the quality in their social media posts was not exactly up to the same standard as their marketing elsewhere. And we also found that their social media was sort of infrequently posting. One of the biggest opportunities we found was free advertising with Google Ads for nonprofits. So Housing Nantucket has begun the application process for that and hopefully something will come out of that. Um, a couple of threats we did notice were the website was previously unsecured, but that has since been remedied, and the community chat on Facebook was somewhat unmoderated, but that again has been worked on. So for our fifth, fifth objective, we built a set of marketing materials for Housing Nantucket, and to do this we used the information from our interviews, our past seller profiles, and the SWOT analysis, which Elizabeth just talked about. So we ended up creating postcards, fact sheets, and a brochure, which we're going to talk about on the next slides. So here's the first side of our postcard, and this is where the address would, would be. And we came up with many drafts for what sentence to put here on the side that would catch people's attention right away. And we used this one because the top reason for sellers to sell was for financial needs. So we liked that it has how they can maximize the value of their property, shows, showing them how they can benefit from the program right away. And on the flip side of our postcard is where most of the information we wanted to show the potential seller. And in the top right-hand corner, we have a blurb about the Covenant program so that they know exactly what it's about directly from the postcard. And we also have a short pitch of how they can um, benefit from the program in the center. And we also were used words such as you and your, just to put the emphasis directly on the person reading the postcard. And the large purpose of this postcard was to drive people to the website, which is why we have the website in the bottom left corner. And we also included the phone number for people who might not want to use their computer and go to the website so they can just call right straight to Housing Nantucket. So after a potential seller is driven to the website, they will be able to find these different Covenant Program fact sheets. So from our interviews, we came up with three different fact sheets. And the first one is for real estate agents. When we were talking to all of the real estate agents, it was a common concern that they weren't knowledgeable enough 
about the Covenant program to recommend it to some of their clients. So we talked to them and we sent them drafts of this and we worked through it to come up with um, frequently asked questions that we put the answers to, obviously, um, different facts about the Covenant program, and other helpful resources for the potential sellers for when they want to start getting involved in the process. The second sheet we came up with was for all property owners, and when we were interviewing the past sellers, uh, a common concern they had was they knew people who wanted to get involved, but they didn't know if they would they would qualify to be a seller. So we put information about if um, where to go if you want to learn if you can qualify. Just go to the website. They have all the information on there. And more frequently asked questions and other useful resources. And the last one was for those um, who need to liquidate an asset. Like I said before in our takeaways, um, if a potential seller is going through a separation, whether it be personal or business, one of their largest assets is usually their home, and if they wanted to buy that, the Covenant program is a perfect solution for that. Another um, thing that we made was the Covenant brochure, and this basically is a universal handout for any potential seller. It has frequently asked questions that were um, common um, among the real estate agents and all the past sellers. It has facts about the Covenant program, how to get involved, how to qualify, how long the process will take, what's the timeline, is this going to be a big chunk of my time in my life to put towards this program. And it also includes a success story. When we were interviewing past sellers, we asked them what the biggest drive um, would be to have a potential seller sell into the Covenant program. And while factual information is very helpful, we also found that it would be equally as helpful to include a success story that would pull on their heartstrings. They would learn um, that they're helping other residents on Nantucket stay on Nantucket, the island that they love. So as we were completing our project, the opportunity came up to create a 360 tour of one of Housing Nantucket's rental properties. While not directly related to the Covenant program, we thought it was a unique piece of marketing and really couldn't pass up on it, so we went ahead with it anyway. And if you're interested in learning more about the Covenant program, Anne is here and she'd be happy to talk with you after the Q&A session, so please feel free to stop by. And we'd just like to thank Anne Kuspa, Housing Nantucket, Bernadette Meyer, our advisors Fred Luft, and Scott Justo, our interview participants, and lastly, the corner table for providing a great workspace for us during the week, and Young's Bicycle Shop for getting us to work every day. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I, I think I heard you refer at one point to what I would care, what I would describe as a contagion effect. That is to say, if somebody in the neighborhood does it, uh, others start to do it. Do you have any insight as to how that comes about? Is it because by leading by example, or does it? Uh, what's the mechanism behind it? Your best guess. Well, when we were talking to our interview participants, some of them it was kind of like, oh, I know someone on my street did this to stay on island, and you know now they're not struggling anymore, that sort of thing. So it's kind of just they they knew the person and they were talking to them, and it came up in conversation. So that's what we found for some of the cases. Yeah, I was just thinking that uh, one, one big accelerator would be if this message could get to the financial advisors that advise people yeah. about their assets yeah. and say, if you need to liquidate your assets, mm -hmm. this is a way to do it. And yeah. it has the ingenious collective consequence of not separating a community into us in one neighborhood and them in another, which is inevitably the root of things going in most American cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean one of the biggest draws of this program is it doesn't increase density on the island. Everything that goes through this program is something that's already zoned residential. So it's not new development per se. When you interviewed past sellers, was there any concern about the legal costs associated with getting started? 
Yes, uh, some past sellers did bring up that the lawyers were more generous with their time for buyers rather than sellers. So that is something we have brought up with Housing Nantucket, and it was a concern among some. But then again, some uh, sellers just went out without legal advice and were able to complete the transaction on their own with just a real estate agent. Yes, so we looked into um, whether or not this would be profitable for everyone. And you may have noticed that when we were talking about waterfront properties, that they would not be likely to do this program because it would likely devalue that property. But in a lot of cases, it will actually make someone more money to go through this process and split their property. They'll end up with a higher value at the end. So that is something we took into consideration. Anything else? Is there an incentive to get the first person on the street? Yeah. Other, than, other than the general, you have a program, you have good. But is there any additional uh, incentive that would kind of help get that going? Um, I think the biggest incentive we found was the money that they can put towards their mortgage or anything else that they need. Is I think a lot of people don't realize that they can divide their property like this, even if normal zoning doesn't allow it. This sort of circumvents those rules to allow for this provision. Um, so, and the, one of the biggest draws for a lot of people is just the the money they get from selling their property keeps them on island and in their home. So, I wonder if you can envision uh, the consequences of this. Let's say being really successful. Let's say it quintuples the number of uh, covenant homes. That people decide they want to use as a way of tapping their equity during an impending recession. Any thoughts on how that might unfold over the next five or ten years? Um, I can't say we've given much thought into that far ahead is if they get that many. Currently, like it's been very slow growth, so it would take a lot for that trend to amp up a lot and I'm sure Housing Nantucket is thinking far ahead about what that will mean for them. Picking up on the question about incentive, here's a, here's a theoretical incentive that might be interesting. Let's say there's a property and the main house is worth 70% and the guest cottage is 30%. If the town were to say, when you sell to 30%, we're not going to reduce your taxes by 70. To 70%, we're going to reduce them to 60%. And, and the town created a pot. Yeah. First come, first serve. It might yeah. be a catalyst. That's certainly an idea, and I'm sure, you know, speaking with Housing Nantucket about that, they're looking at a lot of ways to get in, people into this program. Maybe something like that is an option. And do you know that? 2004. 2004. <laughs> Yeah, before we came to the island, we did a lot of research into similar environments uh, to Nantucket, like island areas that have high tourism and high real estate demand and how they handled that. Housing Nantucket's covenant program is actually really unique and none of them had something like it. So there wasn't really much you could compare it to, even though it's done a lot of good in the community. Thank you very much. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, we're the team that worked with the DPW to conduct a waste character characterization study, analyze the data, and produce outreach based on our findings. I'm Michael Gage. I'm Aiden Wright. I'm Thomas Curtis. I'm Nicola Pincaru. 
All right, so when we left WPI, we were expecting good people, good food, good sites. Um, we weren't really expecting to be digging into trash, uh, but it was a great experience, and we're excited to share it with you. So the objective for this project was to perform a waste characterization and use that information to create strategies to uh, help reduce the landfill on Nantucket. So that included uh, coming up with recommendations to the DPW and coming up with outreach materials that uh, would help the island after we leave. So what is a waste characterization study? Well, it's broken up into three parts. First, we talk to experts at the DPW and uh, gather information about what makes Nantucket's waste stream special. Uh, we use that information to create categories and a plan for our action phase, where we take trash from the DPW, uh, take a sample of it, open it up, take each item out, and put it into different categories. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> once we have all the trash sorted by category, we weigh it, and then we compare the weights to each other in our analysis phase. Uh, once we compare the weights to to each other, we can figure out what percentage of the trash is, say for instance, recyclables that shouldn't be in the household waste. Um, and we use that information to then create the strategies we talked about before. So the planning phase uh, started with us doing a lot of research about the background of recycling, all of the different aspects of it, the history, the economics, everything. And uh, from there, we realized we need to look more into what methodologies we would need to implement to perform a waste characterization. So we looked at uh, other places that have performed waste characterizations, like Millbury, Mil Mil Milbury, uh, where Rob McNeil, the director of the DPW, had performed a waste characterization before, and uh, on at DP, uh, WPI, where there had been waste characterizations performed before. And we compared those methodologies with the methodologies that we would need to uh, perform a waste characterization on Nantucket. What's specific to Nantucket uh, needs to be changed, like the 24-7 uh, biodigester they have on the island. We had to look into special, special considerations for that. Some of the other aspects of our planning phase had to do with uh, preparing our sample, which we did closely with our sponsors. Uh, we ended up having 200 bags. Um, a hundred of them were from drop-off, people who bring their household waste to the landfill physically, and a uh, commercial hauler, a uh, hundred bags from commercial hauler, so people who have a company that they hire to come and pick up their uh, trash at their house. Um, after that, we had to sort our roles out and figure out who was going to fill what position. So, for example, uh, we had a bin manager, we had sorters, of course, we had a note-taker, um, and arguably the most important aspect of our planning phase had to do with figuring out what our categories were going to be because you only get one shot to do the study. You can't really manipulate the data after you've already weighed the, the barrels. So we ended up with eight categories and 18 subcategories. Um, and lastly, we had a little bit to do with scheduling. We ended up having to have a rain check on one of our days, but that was just another component of our planning phase. So this is what our sorting area looked like. We had two big sorting tables where we would dump the trash and then pick through it. Um, there was, around the outside, we had a ring of the barrels, which uh, were labeled by category, and that's where we put the trash into. There was the eight sorters around the table picking through it. There was the bin manager who actively walked around to each barrel and made sure there were no confusions and everything was going where it was supposed to. There was a note taker, which was myself. I didn't have to get into the trash at all. I was just taking notes the whole time, staying dry. Um, and then there was the samples, which was the pile of bags of trash that we were picking through. And then there was the scale, which we weighed the barrels on. So there are two ways of getting your trash to the DPW on the island. The first is taking it to the drop-off at the materials recovery facility where you're going to take all of your trash sorted by whatever recyclable material it is or household waste and uh, drop it off there. Or you can hire a commercial hauler who will come to your house and pick up your recyclables and your trash and take it to the dump for you. From there, uh, we have this diagram of how the waste gets sorted from the MRF. So with all the recyclables, except for glass, which is reused on the island, um, 
they, those get shipped off island. Uh, but the household waste gets taken over here to this uh, 24-7 biodigester we talked about earlier. This cooks the trash at 140 degrees Fahrenheit for four days, and it spins slowly, moving the trash along down these grooves. And what happens is all of the organic material that's in there slowly turns into compost. So by the end, you basically just have a bunch of dirt and whatever is non-compostable uh, balled up together that gets taken out and baled and put into the landfill. We inserted our waste characterization right here. Uh, between the household waste and the biodigester uh, because we wanted to figure out exactly what kind of trash is ending up in the landfill and we wanted to know how much of that trash was uh, the upper, as a percentage of the household waste. So we couldn't just look at the material that came out of the biodigester, we had to look at also the organic material that was in the trash. So uh, please enjoy these uh, pictures of us rifling through the trash for six hours. <laughs> um, so we'll spare you the, uh, the gruesome details, but we spent six hours going through all these bags. And like we said, you can see some of our, uh, our barrels in here. If you go ahead and go to the next slide. You can see Mike out of the line of fire taking notes over there. And a better picture of our barrels over to the side and our sorting table. The smell was kind of a lot, but we got used to it. Um, go ahead. And we were lucky enough to, to have some volunteers, um, both from the DPW and from Remain Nantucket, um, and even uh, rolled up their sleeves and got their hands dirty with us, helping to sort out. We also uh, had a videographer from Remain Nantucket who interviewed Mike, probably because he was the cleanest, um, and they're working on their own materials. So just to reiterate before we jump right into the data analysis, this is, uh, it's called a Sankey diagram, so the width of each stream is representative of its percentage of the total MRF intake. This is from October 2017 data. So uh, you can see the recyclable stream up there, it breaks up into glass, which gets reused on the island. Plastic, tin, aluminum, cardboard all get shipped off and sold, like we said. Um, but what we're really looking at is the household waste here, and right there is where we did our sort, so that we could figure out what how much of this landfill section could have been in the other sections? How much, how much of it could have been diverted before that point? So, one big consideration that we had to make is that Nantucket is a very touristy place. Its population fluctuates between its summer months where it's on season and a lot of tourists come in and the population almost quadruples to the off-season, where the population kind of stays a uh, bit consistent over the years, but it's way less. So as you can see, across all the years, there are different uh, troves, which are which we categorize as our off-season data. And then the high peaks, which we did not look at, when we looked at the low peaks, um, will be the dates during the summer season. So we took our sample, our sample is only representative of the off-season, which we defined to be from October to April uh, of every single year. And we did our waste characterization on October, right in the graph. Now, our data had a lot of different little caveats. There's a bunch of different numbers that we went into, a bunch of different categories that we had to consider. And so we took all this data and we compiled it into a very nice and simple diagrams that we can show you. So on the day of the waste characterization, we personally rifled through about 1,800 pounds of trash um, from all those 200 bags. That's about the weight that it came out to, so quite a bit. Actually, that is about 400 people's worth of daily trash output um, that we just looked through. Now, during the month of October of 2018, there was about 702 tons of waste produced on the island that is that household waste that is aimed to go through the digester and to land the landfill. Now, that is about as heavy as six blue whales, to give you a bit of a comparison. <laughs> Makes it a bit simple to imagine, because who can imagine 702 tons? but six blue whales are a bit closer to imagine. So those whales, they're gonna stick with us and they're gonna try to go into landfill, but let's see if we can divert any of them so that they don't uh, populate it anymore. So. Uh, one of the definitions we're gonna be using during our analysis is divertible waste, and we're just gonna explain what that is. Divertible waste is waste that can be diverted from the landfill uh, by being recycled or composted or repurposed. Uh, so take paper for ex example. Paper can either be recycled or it can be composted. Uh, 
so that paper should ideally never end up in a uh, dumps landfill. It, it can always be used for something else. So important to notice is that we're trying our best to maximize uh, the diversion rate. We're trying to uh, keep the life of landfill as long as possible, and as such, we try to make sure that as little trash as possible comes in. So about 66% of our trash was compostable, and as we said earlier, compostable trash can be considered divertible because it just becomes dirt that the VW just hands out for you for your use if you want to. So if we were to take away 6% of the whales that we are left over, well, if we just about two whales worth of trash that now want to land the landfill. All the other ones have found jobs somewhere else, and they can do different things. And about 34% of the trash left is non-compostable, but that can break down even further. Into different categories. Um, so these are the totals from the different non-compostable uh, non wastes, and they break down into non-divertible waste and possibly divertible waste. So non solo plastics have no home really on the island because since they're difficult to uh, recycle, there's not much of a market to sell them, and so there's not much of a reason to collect them as much. Same thing with films, they're not very saleable, or non-compostable organics such as bones um, are not very useful, they have no home, and they have, they're have they very hard to make programs for. While tin aluminum, textiles, bottles, jars, recycled plastics, those are all found in household waste, but there's already programs that we can try to make sure that we keep them out of the waste. So, right now, as we currently stand, uh, about six of our whales are uh, being in landfill, and with the current uh, status of Nantucket, about four of those are being diverted, and only two land landfill per month during the off season. Now, hypothetically, if we're to maximize and have everybody um, recycle properly and 100% efficiency, then about 17% of trash in total per month would land landfill, which would equal upwards of one only one whale worth of trash, which is about a hundred something tons uh, per month during the off season only. So just a bit of a, a little show. We had six whales to begin with. Now, right now, Nantucket only contributes about two of them per month during the off season. And hypothetically, if they were to be doing their best, most efficient job, they would only consider one. So the next logical step after we've done all of this uh, data analysis is to try to get in touch with the public itself and the people who are actually producing the waste and throwing it away. So uh, we went through a lot of different drafts. There's a few unique challenges that have to do with creating public outreach material for Nantucket because there's a few different audiences. There's visitors in the summer, there's year-round residents, people who use the drop-off facility, people who use commercial haulers. So we worked really hard to try to create something that would kind of cater to as many audiences as possible. So once we got close enough to feeling like we were almost done with our poster, we thought it would help to actually show it to a few members of the public. So we held a focus group. Um, this is uh, our landfill version of the final poster. You can see we've got uh, like streams, if you will, with pictures of examples flowing into their respective categories. There's information on the flip side about yard waste and brush, bulky items, hazardous waste collection days, and uh, two really helpful tidbits that we got from our focus group. We've got a little helpful tip section at the bottom of the front, and on the back there's uh, a not collected at the landfill and what you can do with them alternatively uh, section. And then our final deliverable was a how-to guide on how to replicate our process once we leave. Um, it's a 30-page guide, if you go to the next slide. It goes through each section that we had to go through as we planned the process, from planning to actually conducting it to analyzing it. And each section is broken into chapters that are very easy to understand. And our hope is that once we leave, Nantucket and other places will expand this process and reuse it over the, as time progresses. Um, and it's just a baseline. So we want Nantucket, as they develop new needs, to evolve it and change it as they see fit. Now, for a couple of acknowledgments, I'd like to thank our uh, advisors, Fred and Scott, uh, the DPW, and especially Graham, JP, and Rob. They've helped us out a lot through, throughout the whole thing, especially Young's Bike Shop. They helped us get there in the first place. It's a bit far away. Um, Stubby's really helped feed us. They didn't <laughs> necessarily uh, sponsor us in any way, but it was there, there and close. 
Uh, also, Romain and Taket, thank you so much for coming up and showing uh, and helping us out with the presentation and everything else. Um, the Shipwreck Museum folks for helping us out and showing us a couple new places, and especially the Yacht Club for just housing us during this time. Uh, big thanks to Harvey, Vin, and Peter for keeping the place clean, nice, and listening to any of our uh, issues. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'll have to open the floor for any questions. Yes. Uh, I believe it's recycled into asphalt, so it's crushed up and then put into asphalt. Yes. Do you know, so you talked about the difference between getting your trash picked up um, by a hauler and bringing it to the facility yourself, and when you bring it to the facility, there's tin, aluminum, and plastic, and then when you get it picked up, those, two, those three are together. Do you know why that is, and if they get sorted later? Yeah, so they do sort it at the uh, materials recovery facility. Um, we've actually been told that there's a push to put all plastics into the same container if you're a commercial hauler. So uh, the reason for that is twofold. First of all, it makes uh, recycling plastics easier. You don't need to know necessarily whether everything is recyclable. And uh, there's also an incentive to keep the biodigester cleaner so it doesn't necessarily have as much non-compostable material in it uh, we heard about how uh, after the christmas stroll some christmas lights ended up in there and got tangled up and that caused some problems so uh, it'd be better if we could try and get more of an organic waste stream as separated from plastics and anything else is kind of like this business entity that we don't really want to start like a, a political thing with. And uh, there's all, and they're sort of like the main supplier of most of the materials that end up in like the household trash. Uh, as for the Madikit Mall, uh, we found out pretty early on that they aren't able to, to like get a return on most of the things that people bring in. Most of the stuff that is brought into the Madikit Mall, it gets shuffled out uh, to various places at the end of each week. So uh, it, it just gets filled up over and over again, and there's not enough people coming in and taking stuff out. Uh, so there's not a lot of potential to improve it, I, I think. Or maybe there is, but uh, we just didn't look into that because we were mostly focused on the waste characterization. What, what, sorry, what was the most Uh, Aiden, you found a couple fun things, didn't you? I found a lot of organics, unfortunately, like <laughs> raw chicken and stuff like that. It was pretty bad. I can't even, I don't think I can pick out one. I kind of blocked it out. <laughs> we found some cool, like, uh, wooden carved statue things, like little toys, but they were, like, old. Uh, and one was made of, like, brass or something. It was kind of neat. So yes, we did. Uh, so we had the separate samples, and we took them separately. One was collected. Uh, I think the household drop off was collected days previous, and was just in a bin for us to pick through and uh, separate. Then the commercial hauler came in the day of, so they were plenty fresh, and we looked through that as well. And we separate. We uh, collected all of that, that data separately, and we combined it at the end to come up with all the graphics. Uh, some of the key differences I think there was, I think there were much more organic waste in commercial hauler bags, if I remember correctly. Um, do you guys have any other big differences between them? They were mostly kind of the same. It was fairly similar, but we do have separate data, just didn't have the time to present all of it right now. Mm -hmm. It'll be in our report though, which will be online. <laughs> you guys separate out and Right, that has another kind of component that has to do with your reduction question. We did separately uh, have a container for 2020 banned plastics. Unfortunately, because we did take a look specifically at things that are in the upcoming single-use plastic ban. 
Yeah, our, our theory is that the single-use plastics that are banned in the 2020 thing are going to end up appearing a lot more during the summer. So the summer characterization, if they keep that category in the uh, waste characterization, should help provide more information. So what should we be doing in our homes differently? Um, certainly nothing completely different. Attack is doing a pretty good job, as we've seen from six total uh, worth of units down to two. So it's not doing the bad of a job. Uh, mostly just keeping everything that isn't biodegradable out of just household trash and everything else should be going in their respective bins to best of your knowledge. The guide will definitely help out with that. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be posters and things like that that you can probably look through. But basically trying to keep everything as separate as possible would be the, the, the best thing. Does the bulky trash not go through the compost? It does not. I think the bulky trash is stuff that you would end up having to bring to the landfill anyway. I don't think a commercial hauler is going to come and pick up your washing machine. So... Something similar to that. Yeah. Yes. So you talked about um, the non compostable <clears throat> stuff that goes to the landfill, mm -hmm. um, especially like the plastic, like plastic bags and um, films. Do you see in the future the, avail the ability to separate those out when you go to the facility? and then have them go like directly to the landfill without going through the digester, would that be helpful? I think that's the current plan based off of what our sponsor was telling us. Uh, because our sponsor, Graham, she's the one who suggested on our poster. Uh, maybe we should go back to that slide to show, show the poster because a lot of the questions seem to be around that. Uh, yeah, so you can see that there's plastic bags and films going into the plastics container. Uh, and uh, that was a recommendation from our sponsor, Graham, who said that that's kind of what she wants. She wants us to separate the plastics uh, from the recyclables because they're already sorting through the recyclables um, at the MRF. So I, I guess that's our thought process is to try and reduce the amount that goes through the biodigester. That's something we could do at home is instead of, like when I have plastic, the plastic bag, I know it can't be recycled. I put it in my household trash. Mm -hmm. I just put that in my plastic recycling bin. Yes. Yeah. Which would all plastics in plastic recycling? That's going to be the new point. Yeah. So on, yes. provided that, like, the, the only caveat there is that it should not be too contaminated. It like, you clean. don't want to, you know. Yes. You, you, uh, you again, the, the start, I started your study, but you know, in terms of the politics, of, you know, the, some of the solutions do lie in working with other entities such as Stop and Shop and Pop and Manufacture. Any suggestions or you know insight into you know how to expand the data into reaching out to you know further back in the line? I'll take that. So one of the challenges we didn't really get to talk about is that there's a big push, and I'm sure you guys have noticed, sometimes you'll find plastics that advertise themselves as being made by corn or they say they're biodegradable or they're all plant-based. We're not actually sure for Nantucket specifically if those break down in the compost or not. So there's a whole there's a whole web of things that we're not even sure yet Cause, because kind of along the line of your saying is we could get in touch with people and maybe try to promote them using uh, biodegradable plastics like that, but we're not sure how that would even pan out for us. So that's kind of the first thought in that step, that direction. Because if we don't know that uh the compostable plastics can break down the digester. Mm -hmm. They can't. They can't also be lumped up with recyclable plastics because they're made of a different material, and that would contaminate the whole batch. And nobody wants to take that when it comes to setting off that plastic. So that's the. One hundred percent. It should be going into the household waste because it's better to go through the biodigester and not get mixed in with the recyclable plastics because the the possible results of that contamination could be worse than it ending up in the biodigester because the biodigester has like historically handled plastic before and compostable plastic should break down at least a little bit just a bit of a correction i'll just go over tom but we were told previously that they should totally be going into the recycle waste not the household waste because the mrf hand recycles everything so they will see those plastics and they'll keep them out of the bales that they sell off, not to destroy them, but that one is there. Did you have an opinion on that? It's something that we are looking into, essentially. A big part of it is what breaks down in the composter, and we'll be looking into that this winter. Someday, excited about that. In the meantime, currently, some of it goes into the digester, and some people are recycling some of it. 
<laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, one more question here. Uh, I, I want to be the first to nominate this presentation for uh, uh, a feature presentation during the summer at the Greenland. I think this would be a terrific thing to show to the four whale component of the problem, the seasonal summer residents who are here and who are probably not as committed to the culture of recycling and probably don't enjoy an understanding of the rich tradition of the magical law. You've got these two items here which are going to educate us. We already know pretty much what we need to know and we're pretty much engaged with doing the best we can. But uh, I remember Rob McNeil showed me a study uh, that suggested that when people go on vacation uh, and they're normally recycling at home, they're not so good at it and they kind of give up and the last day they're here they just say, throw it all in a bag and get it out of here. And if you could somehow engage the, the, the four-wheel part of the problem during the summer with something that's maybe half amusing but half serious and say, this is how we do it, this is how you can do it, this is why we do it, uh, and possibly invite them to take on the culture, the ones that come back again year after year, then I think you're getting at the four-wheel part of the problem. Right. Just for your information, the Madigan Ball has a very rich history. Mm -hmm. It was featured in the Wall Street Journal about 30 or 40 years ago. That's where I first read about it. Wow. And the position of being the head of the Madigan Ball is, was at that time a very high status position, almost at the level of royalty. It wasn't something I got elected to. It was something that was given out as a recognition to a Nantucketer. So that's part of the history of the whole thing. Wow. Okay, go ahead, please. We have to push it on here. So, um, as a step off from that, um, Greenland is great, but condense it down, show it on the ferry. Mm -hmm. you know, now that we're limited in what we're watching on the ferry, mm -hmm. this would be an excellent thing to do as people watching as a One of the first things we did on the island was we got to sit in on a town meeting, and that's something that people are actually talking about. There's other organizations, including Remain Nantucket. That's part of the reason that they had a, vigor, a videographer at our way study. That's a, both of those are awesome ideas. And stay tuned. They're in the works. We'll be gone by then. But <laughs> right, We have to move on. Yeah. I want to we'll this. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Luke Ypsilanis. I'm Orion Strickland. I'm Josh DePietro. And I'm Michael Calderoni. And our project was on improving parking management in downtown Nantucket. <coughs> so as many people know who drive on the island, parking spaces can be very hard to come by over the summer months when the streets can become very congested with vehicle traffic. Uh, so our project aimed to uh, further explore issues with parking so we can uh, propose solutions to better manage on-street parking and as a byproduct improve the traffic flow. So our two main goals of our project were to focus on parking and traffic flow, and then also to analyze new parking management systems and present them to the town. Um, and we laid out a list of objectives for us to uh, go about to accomplish these two goals. Uh, the first objective was to gauge the current on-street parking conditions. Uh, to do this, we carried out a parking inventory, um, which will be detailed later in the presentation. Um, yeah, our second objective will be t was to propose on-street parking changes that are aimed at both improving uh, vehicle traffic flow on uh, selected streets in the downtown, um, and then also to promote alternative modes of transportation. Uh, and the third objective uh, was more aimed at our second goal, um, where we evaluated potential new parking management systems and presented them to the town. Uh, and our fourth objective uh, is also very important, was to take into account um, our stakeholders' views and opinions on our proposed solutions and then make changes accordingly. So some of the current parking-related problems that we began to notice at the start of our project uh, were a product of streets in the downtown area being very narrow. Um, and narrow streets, a uh, consequence of the sidewalk parking, uh, vehicles that are parked can often constrict the sidewalks to a point where they're inaccessible completely or it is very hard to pass by without walking out into the street to get around the parked cars. Um, and even still, some bigger delivery trucks, as you can see this FedEx truck driving down India Street, 
are forced to drive up onto the opposite curb uh, just to get by the parked cars. And over time, uh, this has a very negative consequence of uh, damaging the sidewalks on the opposite side of the road. As you can see here, there's a deep rut that's been carved into the sidewalk on the other side of the curb from vehicles constantly having to drive up and over just to get by on the streets. So as Luke mentioned, we had an inventory process in order to help us identify where and when problems were occurring. So this is the first step of an improved inventory process that our team designed. First, our team would go out with paper maps and we would mark the relative locations of where vehicles were. We would also take note as to where, um, when vehicles were there, whether they were parked on the sidewalk, and also whether or not they were a commercial or commuter vehicle. And as you can see on the slide, this is an example of one of our maps of uh, Fair Street, actually. The next step we had was to input all of our data using Google Forms. The reason we used Google Forms was because originally this process would take one person about 12 hours to do in terms of inputting data. But by using Google Forms, our team was able to have multiple users simultaneously inputting data at the same time, which tremendously cut down on the workload. Another benefactor of using Google Forms to input all this data was that we were able to have access to the raw data and then edit and duplicate it if we need be. So the third step that we had was we had to input all this data into an ArcGIS layer. For those of you who aren't unfamiliar with ArcGIS, it's essentially a mapping tool that is used by government agencies and engineering firms to help integrate geographic data. The, re the reason we used it was to help us display all of the data on a map of the town and also help us visually sort out what we wanted to see. So here we have an example of all of our data that we gathered from this past Christmas stroll. And here is an image of all that data filtered out so that we could only see the vehicles that are parked on the sidewalk at, during noon. Here is that image from the Fair Street map along with the filtered layer image. And as you can see from the filtered layer image, it is much easier to see and also is a lot evident as to where the problems are. So from the GIS software, we were able to extract all of our data into different Excel sheets uh, based on the day that we took the inventory on. Um, we then we created this table to automatically count up uh, all of the different classifications of vehicles that we had, um, such as uh, cars, cars parked on the sidewalk, work vehicles, and it's all listed here in the table. And then you can also see over on the left, um, the table is further broken down based on the time period that the inventory was taken on and then each specific street uh, that was counted up. And once the table has been set up uh, to display a certain day's worth of data, um, we have all the data shown in the middle of the table. We then created a column to add up all the total vehicles parked on that street at that specific time. Um, and then once we have that number, we were able to use the total amount of parking spaces on the street and then the total vehicles that we observed had been parked to get a utilization percentage for each street at each time throughout the day. Um, and then the whole point of this table is we wanted to have a way to display and analyze just the data we gathered, but it is also going to be a tool moving forward for the town to be able to use uh, since it's very adjustable and flexible to changes. Um, as you can see over here, the reason that this is helpful is you, we can, we're able to edit uh, which time blocks that the inventory was taken on, and you can also edit uh, each street that was analyzed. So these just happen to be the 16 streets that we had looked at, um, but they're easily changeable uh, and the table still works the same. So to go more into how the table operates, there are three important locations in the file um, that are very easy to use and uh, they're clearly explained on how to operate. So the one on the left uh, is the most important cell of the entire file. This is where you tell the table which day of data you want to look at. So as you can see there, it reads 12.01.18 park data. So that's telling the entire table to look at the data from December 1st. Um, so any day that we have data for, all you have to do to look at it in the table would be to type in the name of the sheet that the data is saved under. And then in terms of the street names and the different times throughout the day, these are also uh, editable from these two tables on the right. 
So any other streets that the town wishes to add or change, all that you have to do to change it in the main table is to just change the title of the street there, and the entire table will update automatically. And the same thing goes for the time blocks. So originally our inventory process before making improvements would take all of us approximately 18 and a half hours to complete. After making some improvements, we were able to get the process down to about 11 and a half hours. Now mind you, for this process, the original one would take 18 and a half hours for about 600 cars or about 32 cars per hour in order to be data for data collection and processing. The new process that we did over Stroll we were able to get it down to 11 and a half hours for 2,000 vehicles, which means about 174 vehicles per hour. Now, that's all relatively small still, given that Nantucket has approximately 1,300 parking spaces in the downtown region, meaning it would still take our team about seven and a half hours if we were to inventory all of the cars in those spaces in one instance of time. As O'Brien said, the process is relatively slow. Also, we can, uh, it, our process only provides a snapshot of a street at a certain time. We can only record cars while we are on that street. Furthermore, the manual aspect of it gives it a degree of error. Through the use of technology, we can have an accurate snap, uh, portrayal of a street throughout the day, and it can be uh, processed in seconds. So there are uh, different factors to consider when looking to implement technology on Nantucket. To uh, learn about the conditions of the island, we talked to the IT department as well as the deputy chief of police. Uh, through conversation with them, we learned that devices have to have a certain engineering standard to uh, be weather resistant on the island. Furthermore, <clears throat> furthermore, uh, the downtown has minimal network infrastructure, uh, which can also uh, is a factor you need to consider. We reached out to multiple tech companies and we received responses from Smart Parking and Civic Smart. Over here you can see Smart Parking's in-ground sensor. On the left is about the size of a soda can and you can also see it uh, in, in the street. On the right we have Civic Smart's, uh, one of Civic Smart's gateways. These are put onto light posts so they can collect data from sensors on a street and then send it back to be processed. Note that the solar panel is completely optional. Um, when we, as we were talking, talking to tech companies, we took all of the information we gained from, got from them and put it into a decision matrix, which allows us to organize and compare different specs from different companies and different sensors. Uh, this makes it very easy to compare uh, across multiple uh, companies. This is something we're going to be leaving for the town if, when they are moving forward so that uh, they can also use this. So now given all of these uh, limitations and other things to take into consideration, we recommended the following steps. Based on our conversation with the IT department and everything, we highly recommend improving the cellular network on the island. This is imperative for moving forward with any technological system and also it will just bring up many improvements to the community as a whole. In parallel with that, we recommend also continuing the inventory process that we just went over or potentially making improvements to it so that way more uh, problemed areas in downtown can be identified and analyzed. And then after doing all that, we recommend integrating some sort of sensor system into downtown and using revenue generated from the parking benefit districts to help maintain the system and potentially make improvements to it. All right, so on top of exploring technology for mentioned parking, our other objective was looking at improving street conditions, which included on-street parking, traffic flow, and pedestrian access. Using Photoshop, we were able to visualize different street reconfigurations that have been considered, um, when, uh, mod like such as modifying the curb, delaying spaces, prohibiting parking, and more that are detailed in our report. So. A problem we noticed was that since the town does not have marked spaces, um, some cars can take up more space than needed, or some can actually park bumper to bumper sandwich in cars, giving them no space to actually get out. Um, an option uh, we explored was the delaying spaces. As you can see on the picture to the right, we photoshopped, we added some little white tees to mark to some marked spaces. Um, 
this would allow for like the parking on the on the town to be a little, little more organized, but it comes at the cost of it being less flexible. So cars can't move, get closer to each other, fit in a few extra. And this option also has to be considered when you're implementing some tech parking management technologies. And another problem we identified was mentioned before was a lot of, there's a lot of narrow roads and on top of the narrow roads, a lot of the sidewalks on these narrow roads are also kind of small which you can see on the picture on the right where there, the traffic flow at that time was very congested, causing our team to have to move to the side. Um, and all, a solution we looked into that was prohibiting parking on, on these certain areas where, the, where it's very narrow. Um, this would open up the lane for drivers as well as make the pedestrian access a lot better for people. And then um, this comes out of the cost that like you would lose a few more spaces considering how many spots you take out. But it also comes at, there's also a benefit of adding other options. So like mentioned before, like we were biking on this street, we had to move out of the way for a lot of cars. But if you apply no parking, um, you can implement also a bike lane, which can make it very accessible for all users because the bikers will feel more comfortable in the lane as well as creates a space between the driving lane and the pedestrians on the sidewalk making them feel more at ease when walking down them. In addition to uh, narrow roads, oh no, yeah, yeah, in narrow roads, um, the, another alternative we wanted to look at was uh, doing a multiple curb. So that is making the curb a little more slanted, which makes it for cars that need to park on the sidewalk on some streets that to have no choice for this to happen giving it more ease just to get on top of that sidewalk. This also also helps um, bikers that are riding on these uh, roads that need to get out of the way and fade some of the traffic. It gives them like more ease to get on these sidewalks instead of stopping, lifting up their bike and mounting on the top of the sidewalk. Now here we listed out a lot of the streets we uh, looked at and some of the options we looked at as well. And we also want to include the amount of spaces on each of the streets that will be impacted by some of these options. Okay, so these are just some of the options that we've proposed for street reconfigurations um, in the downtown area. Uh, we want to emphasize that each street can have its own customized solution uh, in order to cater to the unique circumstances that each street presents. Uh, and so for this reason, to move forward, uh, we advise that uh, further in on which of these options is best suited for each of the streets, if any of them. Um, and we also advise that when the town is ready to move forward with implementing some of these changes, to implement one or a few at a time on particular streets, uh, and to use that uh, to either prove that the concept works or to use it um, to better advise the town on a different direction to go with the street. As Luke was saying, for the future, we would encourage the town to continue using our inventory process, as well as improving it through the use of technology. We also uh, created many options for tech and non-tech solutions, and uh, to-do lists for each of these solutions, if the town decides to move forward with them. Uh, in the end, it is up to the town and the citizens to decide which options work best for which areas. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsors, Mike Burns, Peter Morrison. We'd also like to thank our professors, Fred and Scott, um, also the police and the IT departments, as well as Civic Smart and Smart Parking, and uh, as well as other townspeople we talked to. Um, very special thanks to the Young Spikes, for without, we could not do our project. take notes on certain days that when we were going out on kind of the conditions uh, that the roads were in or that like say for instance the weather 
Um, we tried to get data from pretty much every day of the week uh, to kind of get a really good snapshot of uh, how the parking data would fluctuate uh, between days. So yes, we did get a kind of a good look at different uh, circumstances. <laughs> Have you uh, had any interaction with any of the neighborhood associations, particularly the town association, to get a sense of you know whether they're engaged in this and they seem to watch it? Uh, yes, we have talked to some of the town associations. We actually talked to a member, um, Henry Terry, I believe, who was a representative of which town association? one of the town associations, and he gave us his opinions and insights into many of the options and understood them. At the beginning, you talked about alternative uh, streets and cars, but the alternate transportation. Is there any information there? So like some of that was like towards like kind of like the end we talked about like promoting like the bike lanes so like there'd be more bikers. Um, we kind of did want to like kind of try to like other systems like if you just install maybe like a shuttle system that for the summer that could bring people in if you have a parking lot outside the downtown area, kind of forcing the cars not to come in as much as in the downtown area. But that's something why we said probably conduct a um, study that can assess that better. So the, our project mostly focused on determining the compatibility of these technologies with Nantucket. And the scope of the, uh, um, the sensors and their varying systems is that many of these systems can detect vehicles. They're highly accurate in doing it. They're able to give all of the data that we took about eight, 11 hours to gather. They could gather all of that data in a second once they're implemented. And also these technology systems also incorporate with many mobile apps and whatnot that allow paying parking systems, uh, reservation systems, and other various features that could be implemented with the town. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Any thoughts about the, uh, the applicability of those kind of concepts on Nantucket? Uh, um, well, the, the most important takeaway from implementing a sensor system, it kind of is a management system for parking, is the town would be able to get real-time parking data on every space that's being monitored by a sensor. Um, so they would have data at all hours throughout the day. They would know exactly how many spaces are being used, the frequency that they're being used. So you'll be able to start to form a picture of more high traffic areas. Uh, and it just gives the town a lot of data to work with to then better manage the parking system. Follow up with your answer just a moment ago. Um, did you look at all at demand pricing whereby um, parking would cost more on certain days of the week or times of the day? Uh, yeah, that was something we kind of looked into our, uh, with our research. Um, uh, the way the system worked that we looked at is air, like high traffic areas and places of high demand in the central core district of the city where you would maybe charge more for the parking because it's a the parking space would be in a higher demand than a space that's maybe on the outskirts of town. Um, so that's something we did look into. So there was a lot of discussion about many solutions that weren't just technical. But uh, primarily, uh, the scope of our project was to focus on some technical street um, uh, road systems and also some redesigns as well. We did look into it, but it was just a little out of the scope for our project. Okay, thank you again. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark McFadder. I am John Amaral. I'm Yanni Periocani. And I'm Lauren Thompson. And today we'll be discussing how we uh, 
attempted to and uh, are in the progress of uh, innovating the Nantucket tree inventory. Uh, so to start, Nantucket actually has a, a really beautiful uh, and diverse uh, tree ecosystem that not a lot of people know of, uh, as well as a really interesting history to uh, the trees, uh, specifically those uh, in the urban and downtown areas. Uh, so urban trees, I'll be saying that a lot. I refer to the trees in the downtown area, the domesticated trees, the trees that we intentionally planted, and not the ones that grew there naturally. Uh, so first off, we often take trees for granted. So this is an image of uh, a uh, Gillett Avenue in Illinois before and then the same street after uh, Dutch elm disease took place, which Dutch elm disease is something that actually uh, was a pretty popular event um, in the history of uh, downtown trees in Nantucket. Uh, so as you can see, it's kind of plain and clear the aesthetic difference in this street uh, before and after the trees took place, uh, before and after Dutch elm disease. Uh, more than just an aesthetic value, the trees um, in downtown areas and urban trees also provide a lot of other uh, useful resources to people. Uh, they help with irrigation for stormwater. They absorb CO2, which helps both reduce pollution and lowers the heat of a town. Uh, and as well as that, it also... Uh, there have been studies produced by both Yale and the University of Arizona that suggest that just the presence of urban trees and downtown trees help with uh, reducing stress and anxiety. Uh, so what is a tree inventory? So very simply, a tree inventory is a method of keeping track of information uh, about individual trees. So we keep track of things such as uh, the date the tree was planted, uh, what, what type of tree it is, how tall it is, uh, any noteworthy maintenance things. Um, there's a lot of different types of tree inventories. The one that we'll be discussing, the one that we've been working on, is known as a cover inventory, which means it uses GPS and GIS, uh, geographic information system software, uh, to help pinpoint and locate trees on where they are um, in like a GPS system. So like uh, the previous group was saying, we could put them into a data layer and view them on a map exactly where each tree is and then see information about that. Uh, so why do we need a tree inventory? Well, firstly, uh, every tree is different. Um, depending on the species, the height, the width, the age, tons of factors go into how you uh, care and keep, um, keep track of each tree, and every bit is important. Uh, it's important for maintenance. Uh, you can keep track of the damage of the sidewalk, uh, for example, is one of the things that we can tra keep track of here. Uh, parking group is giving me eyes in the back. Uh, the, uh, you can keep track of um, how this is damaged. We can use this um, for a, in a proper tree inventory. We can use this to uh, help with the Department of Public Works to um, take care of the sidewalks and see which trees um, are impeding the most, which trees need limbs cut, etc. Uh, and as well as that, one of the other things that we'll be working on and looking at is actually educating people um, with tree knowledge. Uh, because if we keep track of the information, of this kind of information, uh, we can use it to educate people on the trees in downtown Nantucket and kind of help them learn that history that we had. Uh, we'll get more into this design of what we have later in the presentation. Um, so our overarching project goal was to enhance the urban tree appreciation and maintenance in downtown Nantucket, and we decided to do this through the lens of the tree inventory. So we reviewed the previous tree inventory, which was started from a set of data cards, moved to an Excel sheet, and then we created a list of attributes to record of each tree, and then we used that list to update the tree inventory. And then after we updated the tree inventory, we used it to create an engaging and educational mobile site about the trees. So now it seems that going from the attribute list to the tree inventory seems simple, but as you can see, it's not really. Um, this is kind of a basic list of the components that we went through when making the tree inventory system. We'll go through this in more detail in later slides, but to give you a basic idea, we had our attribute list that we converted to a fi file format called the data dictionary, which was then imported into a GIS Trimble unit, which was a handheld data collection device that we used in the field to collect all the data about the trees. And then that data was exported into an Excel spreadsheet that was compiled into the current tree inventory. 
And then now that we have a tree inventory, we can use it to produce deliverables such as a data layer map or for data analysis or the mo a mobile website. And what we also did was that we created procedures for this process so that it could be repeatable and done by future data collectors. So this is a list of most of the attributes that we collected during our data collection. Um, they're separated into primary and secondary categories. The primary attributes are attributes that the NLC and DPW prioritize for us to record, such as the identification numbers, obviously like the name of the tree and the species, and like stuff like the condition of the tree and any damage or maintenance notes. And then the secondary attributes were still important, but they weren't as prioritized because they could be entered in at a later date by people who knew these facts, such as like the history of the trees or certain like diseases or the dates planted and stuff like that. So uh, what we did was um, we converted the attribute list that you saw previously into a file format, this electronic format, which is known as a data dictionary, which is simply just the list of attributes, but each attribute has a specific input type. For example, uh, each tree has a unique identification number, and that can simply be entered in as a number. Uh, whereas other attributes such as disease and sidewalk condition can be entered in as a a rating, a scale from one to five, and it can also have a comment box that you can type any words into. Um, the purpose of creating this data dictionary in the first place was to be able to load it onto this device that you see here, which is the GIS Trimble unit. Uh, the convenience of, convenience of using this unit is that it can record the exact location of each tree while the user records these attributes as well through the data dictionary. So to test out the data dictionary, a trial area was conducted. Um, on Main Street, 145 trees were surveyed and uh, attributes were collected on each one of those. And for each attribute, it's important to make sure to have the proper equipment, such as for measuring the diameter of the tree trunk and for uh, species identification when a lot of the trees are, a lot of the leaves are off the trees and they're really high up and you need to use binoculars for them. Um, but it's important to make sure to use the right equipment to be as accurate as possible when recording that information. So after, we, after the data was collected, it was combined into one final spreadsheet, an excerpt of which is shown here. And it's important to make sure that uh, everything is organized properly and efficiently. A number for each tree, which is identified by the street name and a number for that street. So for example, there might be a, street, uh, a tree on Main Street, so it would be Main, and then for example, 57. That would be the unique tree number for that tree on Main Street. And so it became increasingly important as time went on to keep track of the different attributes we recorded, um, mainly based on both educational related data, such as the species, genus, and common name, and historical facts like the date planted, as well as maintenance related attributes, such as the tree condition and whether it needed maintenance in general or not. So obviously there's a lot of different steps involved in making this tree inventory system. So procedures were created and outlined to make sure that others later could continue our work. So we made four, uh, specifically four different procedures, instruction manuals to follow. There was one for operating the unit itself. There was one for collecting the different attributes for each tree. There was one for processing that data and putting it into the spreadsheet you saw earlier. And one final one to put the trees on uh, an interactive map that could display each tree location. And so uh, it was important to test this out on someone who could potentially be doing this kind of work in the future. So. Uh, we had our good friend Mikey from the parking group to actually test out our uh, procedures and make sure that they were as detailed as possible so anybody in the future could potentially use them to collect this data. Okay, so how, how everyone has touched upon in the previous slides, we were talking about the procedures that um, we use to collect the data and to get it into the inventory system. So now we're gonna display what you can actually do with the data once it's in the inventory system. So this is a map, like the first group we talked about, the ArcGIS, it's in online form and you can put in the GIS locations of, in our case, each tree. So each of the green dots is a tree and the blue ones are specifically American elms that we highlighted. So this is Main Street, as you can see, the Harbor and Madiket and Monument Rotary and this is just a great way to visualize and you can highlight different things like the size or the species of the trees. And this is a chart that's showing the species on Main Street. 
So we only collected data on Main Street due to the con time constraint because we only had seven weeks to do all these things to create the inventory. But this is just highlighting that the green are variety of elm. And as you can see, there's a lot more elm than other species on Main Street. But it's important to note that there are other species and that adds to the variety and cuts down on the spreading of disease like that happened in the 1800s with the Dutch elm disease. And this is just another example of the species on Main Street, but this time we're comparing the 1980s data to the 2018 data. So these are just the American elm varieties, and from the 1980s to the 2018 data, the shift has gone from American elm to the Dutch elm disease varieties. The Boisman elm, the elm hybrids, and the Zelkova, they're all were made to be resistant to the Dutch elm disease, and that's why they're more popular today than the American elm. And finally, this is a similar chart, but this is showing the diameter of the trees. So this is the 1980s data, and as you can see, the diameters are mostly smaller, one to five inches, and that indicates that the trees are younger and healthier, and they're not causing as much damage to the sidewalks and roads. As we move forward to the 2018 data, 30 years later, a lot of the diameters have doubled in size, and that's great for shade and the aesthetic reason of the streets, but the larger diameter can cause damage to the sidewalks as the parking group has realized and we've realized, and it can also make the trees more prone to disease and storm damage because they're older and they're not as healthy as they were back in the 1980s. Uh, so one of our uh, final deliverables for the project was to create some kind of method uh, in which we could help educate and kind of teach people about uh, the trees in the downtown area and learn about them. Uh, so the way that we uh, chose to approach that was to create a prototype for a mobile website uh, that anybody can just open up on their phone and be able to use whenever they want. Um, <clears throat> We designed it with the idea of kind of a game in mind, because uh, our target audience is kind of more aimed towards uh, families and children uh, to help kind of teach them about it, but as well, uh, which is the main area, which is the scavenger hunt, which we'll show you in a second. Uh, but there's also a second area called the mobile tree tour, uh, which is less kind of uh, interactive and game-based and more just an interactive way that you can look at uh, the entire layout of the data layer and get to see uh, kind of neat information about each tree. So we'll do like a little uh, run through of it right now. So we have the scavenger hunt mode, which we'll go into right now. Uh, so right there uh, in the top bar is the back button to take you back, as well as the menu bar, which will open up. Uh, you can see your progress of how far you've made it in the scavenger hunt, settings to change any settings, and help to figure out how to use the application. Uh, the bottom bar is the three main buttons, the uh, quest button, the answer button, and the learn button. We have a notification in the quest button, so we click it. Our tree friend comes in uh, and says, hey, I'm looking for a friend uh, near a smoothie store on Main Street. He has a tag number. Could you get that tag number, please? Uh, so that then changes it so you have one point in the answer area. You head to the answer area. You're given the ability to punch in a three-digit combination uh, on a tag. Once you do that successfully, you would get one point right there uh, on the scavenger hunt that tracks your progress of how far you're making it. And after you do that, you get to learn some uh, fun information about the tree himself. Uh, like, for example, that this one is a Princeton elm, like he's immune to, elm, uh, to Dutch elm disease. Uh, yeah, so we, we also designed a little bit of kind of fun in it. Uh, there's another thing you can do is you can walk around the map and occasionally noteworthy trees will uh, pop up. You can tap on them uh, and learn about the a fun fact about them, like this one is an American elm that survived the Great Fire. Uh, and you also get another point that way. Uh, we had discussed that at some point you could, once you complete it, you could redeem uh, your victory for like a sticker or a little plush toy or something like that as a present. Uh, so this is the uh, mobile tree tour. So instead of it being a game based, you just see all of the trees. You can click on one of them and information will pull up about uh, that specific tree, for example, that that one was the first Boozman Elm uh, planted. 
uh, etc. So that is uh, the basic run through of the prototype that we have. This is this is just a UI mockup. We've also been working on actually developing it and getting our hands on it and actually creating it. Uh, we're not anywhere near that level of creation, but we're slowly kind of chugging along and we're going to have it so that we can uh, have a worked through prototype that we can pass along so that other people could continue working on it and trying to get it to uh, like full completion so it can be implemented. Um, so for future work with the tree inventory and its associated deliverables, some recommendations we have that were touched upon before were to remake the ID numbers for the trees. As it stands, there are two different sets of ID numbers from two different areas and they do not correlate at all. So we suggest, as mentioned before, a system where it would be the street name plus a number. For example, a tree on Main Street would be like Main 27. And then another recommendation is that to collect data in the summer and winter. In the, in the summer, it would be more easier to identify the trees based on their leaves because that's the main way you identify them. And in the winter, without the leaves in the way, you can better see like maintenance or damage issues of the trees. And then the third recommendation is to use the data analysis to create maintenance programs. For example, if you have the graph of like tree diameter versus the year, you can look at the trend and be like, oh, we should closely monitor this many trees per year or this many sidewalk spots per year, and you can get a more like predictive, predictable maintenance plan. And then the last recommendation we have is to obviously further develop the mobile website by adding more noteworthy trees and scavenger clues and as Mark mentioned before, also implementing some sort of like sticker certificate-esque prize given by, say, the NLC to, um, upon completion of the scavenger hunt. Yeah, just as a little footnote, this is a, the current application as we have it finished. Um, and as we're developing it, uh, none of the buttons do anything at the moment. Actually, the, the tree button at the bottom like has the tree friends scroll in. But uh, this is just kind of an image of what the progress is so far. Some acknowledgments that we have, we'd like to thank our sponsors, the NLC, and we'd also like to thank the DPW for working with us on this project. And we especially like to thank our liaisons, Emily and Cormac. And we'd like to thank our sponsors, Scott and Fred, for helping guide us on this project. Um, we'd also like to thank Dale and Scott for helping us identify trees and teaching us about the trees. And we'd like to thank Vince for data collection advice that he gave us. And we'd like to thank the Tree Advisory Committee for letting us sit on their meeting. And we'd like to thank Young's Bicycle Shop and the Nantucket Yacht Club for accommodations. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we'd uh, like to open the floor to any questions that anybody has. Yep. Did you try to get the age of the trees? Um, so... Uh, so none of us are actually like tree experts by any means of the term. So we uh, didn't have any sort of expertise beyond just basic identification. So we were able to tell if some tree was older than some kind of tree, but we didn't really have a method of actually telling when the tree was planted or how old it was besides looking at past data. Yeah, uh, just to add on to that, um, we actually, we were able to get some historical info about some of the trees. Unfortunately, a lot of the data is missing. Um, some of the trees had dates planted on them, but unfortunately not all of them are there. Um, so it was kind of tough for us in certain areas to be able to do that, especially with how old they are, um, just because that data is missing. But it's definitely something to look into if we were to able to get that data. I mean, that would be the idea. Unfortunately, like we said, like we don't have a lot of uh, access to that information at the moment, but that's definitely something, especially in our, our uh, mobile website that we prototyped, that would definitely be something interesting to show users and have them learn more about it, but that's definitely a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we do have a description. We have uh, 
the data dictionary is in a uh, file format and all the options to select when you're out in the field are actually described so that someone could look back and see if they're matching up with what we had. My name is Ben Thornton, and I'm a biomedical engineer at WPI. My name is Mitch Reed. I'm a mechanical engineer at WPI. My name is Mackenzie Phillips, and I'm a management information systems major. My name is Bailey Joseph, and I'm a mechanical engineering major at WPI. So we are the group of students that have been working with the Nantucket Historical Association exhibiting simple machines at the Old Mill. For those of you who don't know, the Old Mill is a historic landmark that is owned by the Nantucket Historic Association, and it's recognized by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers for being America's oldest still operating smock windmill, and it is the structure that we had the pleasure of working with hands-on for the past seven weeks. Um, in this video, you see some of the things that we got to do with it. So we got to take the vanes off the mill for the winter, and we also got to um, put the sheets on the, on the mill. Yes, it's just some footage of us working with our sponsors. So the, our project mission was to enhance the visibility of the Tucket Old Mill by creating interactive exhibits that showcase engineering principles present inside the mill. Because the mill is known for its historic engineering, we thought that it had the potential to um, have educational lessons based on exhibits. The flow of this presentation will go from our background research, the initial designs of our exhibits, the final designs, the supplemental resources we created, and future recommendations to the Nantucket Historic Association in regards to our project. Before we came to Nantucket, we did extensive research on exhibit design as well as exhibit criteria to build designs. So to do this, we visited a few different locations like the Sturbridge Village and Sturbridge Mass in the Ecotarium in Worcester Mass. At these locations, we got to interact with a bunch of different exhibits and kind of learn what people like, what kids are playing with, what needs signs, kind of what's easy to do, and kind of fun exhibits in that sense. Along with that, we did research into exhibit criteria, which we just looked up online, and we got from our sponsors, and we kind of just compiled a big list. Here's one of our charts we created, where we put the criteria for safety, durability, uh, movability, and types of things. So we made a little list of each of our exhibits, and we checked off which uh, criteria each of the exhibits made. So like you can see, the safety was checked for all of them because that's really important, a key aspect. But for example, like some of them aren't as durable, but they can be kept inside. So we went through for each one of our exhibits and made sure we met all the criteria to determine for each one. Like Mackenzie mentioned, we gained a lot of really valuable experience working with the old mill um, through some of our sponsors with the NHA. And some of the things that we really wanted to highlight, like in that video, is raising and lowering the sailcloths like they do when the old mill is running to catch the wind and taking the veins off of the mill um, when it's the winter season so that uh, the NHA can preserve them and maintain them in the off season so they're not damaged in the winter. And kind of learning how the mill operates and is maintained gave us a lot of really good insight into how the core machinery of the mill works as well as just kind of being comfortable in that setting and understanding what the old mill is all about and some of the history of it. So, like Bailey mentioned, through observing how to maintain, preserve, and how the mill runs, we took note of each of the different simple machines that the old mill is comprised of, such as the vanes that catch the wind, the gears that turn the main grind shaft on it, and the levers and pulleys that serve as uses uh, that are used for mechanical advantage to lift the grindstone and such. So here we have a picture of the main and only gear mesh in the in the mill. It's actually located right on the top where where the mill turns. This is the main, this is uh, the grounds for what was our first exhibit, which is the shifting gearbox. So the main purpose of this exhibit is to serve as an educational tool to display gear ratios. So, so here we have, so you can see here, these are, these are more blueprints that we made up for um, how each of it is made. And these are actually what we would be giving to the NHA in case Anything in, the, anything in the exhibit breaks, so we have exact dimensions on how it works. But um, the main purpose of this exhibit is to show how gear ratios work. And what we have is 
on one side we have a 16 tooth gear and on the other side we have an eight an eight tooth gear and then an eight to an eight um tooth cage gear in the center so the gears also are very similar to how to what is actually used in the uh the mill itself the mill runs on a cajun gear or a cajun crown gear so we made our own cajun crown gears and we have it so that you can rotate the cage gear between the two crown gears and you can um, you can observe the difference between a two to one ratio and a one to one ratio in the gears. The next simple machine that we really thought was important in the operation of the old mill is this large box of rocks. Um, this is actually something that is quite crucial to the operation of the old mill as it acts as a brake um, for not turning and turning that large crown gear that Ben had just showed us. Um, this is also pretty interesting to exhibit in the old mill because most visitors don't actually know where this is located as this box of rocks is located on the third floor of the old mill and is often inaccessible to people. And so we, found, we thought this would be a great opportunity to kind of bring out that often less accessible simple machine in the old mill and bring it to visitors. This is one of our initial designs um, for this box of rocks lever uh, simple machine exhibit. We really wanted to focus on bringing the idea of mechanical advantage to the visitors who come to our exhibits at the old mill. Mechanical advantage is the principle that the farther away you get from a fulcrum point, like that middle point on the lever, the easier it is to pull down on a load on the other side. Our initial designs thought maybe we can build some sort of collapsible handle that users build together because our research hinted that the more you build, the better you interact with the exhibit and the more you learn. But we found that this was actually a little bit more complicated. You go to the next slide. And we came up with this new um, detailed design. And like Ben mentioned, this is another one of those SOLIDWORKS drawings that serves as a reference for the NHA to uh, reproduce or fabricate another version of this exhibit. Our final design was uh, a little bit different than, than that initial design. And we actually feature uh, simply three different ropes hanging at different um, distances away from that fulcrum point, each color coded red, yellow, and green to show how becomes hard, um, medium, and then far more to lift up the box of rocks. The next exhibit we took a look at was using pulleys. In the mill, there's pulleys that are used to lift that box of rocks that you saw earlier, so that way it's easier to lift based on the weight. They also used pulleys back in the day to lift the corn up to the roof, and that's how they would end, put the corn inside the gears to grind them and everything. So based off of that, in a simple physics experiment I took in physics course, in my physics course, we built a ramp type design where kids could pull the pulleys and see how fast the car goes up. So here's a, another one of those SOLIDWORKS designs where you can see all the different components so that way the NHA can replicate and fix anything that goes wrong. And then here's our final design where we have two different ramps that can each be adjusted to different heights as well as the carts which can have weights in them and pulleys so kids can race each other, put different weights in their carts, put different weights on the pulleys, change the angles, and kind of just see what the different weights make the difference and race each other and have a fun competition with it. Our final exhibit that we were able to produce for the NHA is called the Sheets to the Wind, and it is based off of the experience that we um, had taking the uh, sails on and off the structure with the smock top that I mentioned earlier, which is the uh, triangular structure on top that can actually be rotated so the vanes can face into the wind. And what we were really trying to achieve with this exhibit is teaching people the uh, reasonings behind how many sheets to the wind. So sometimes when you go to the windmill there will only be two sheets on or there will be four or none and it's all based on air density, the, speed, the wind speed, the temperature, and the humidity. So this is our initial design, another one of the SOLIDWORKS under consideration we're making the inside of the mill structure hollow so it can be weighted down. Um, it's also storage for the sheets that we made. And now... So buildings, we just got to really have a fun time where we got to also learn a lot of engineering ourselves about how to build these exhibits. One of the instructional panels that will be by, one of, that will be by the Blocks of Rocks exhibits. And each of our exhibits will have these. So it has a small blurb on it that relates it to the mill. Um, because each of these engineering principles are actually present in the mill. So it says, how did the miller stop the windmill from spinning? The answer is simple. They use a giant box of rocks. 
Um, it proposes a challenge, which is something we found in our research um, at the Ecotarium in Worcester, Mass. It's a small children's museum with all sorts of interactive exhibits. Um, we noticed that they all propose a challenge, which just encourages interactivity with children. Um, it also includes the instructions, some safety precautions, do not hang or climb on the exhibit, and then just an explanation of the engineering principle going on. Uh, what's going on here, mechanical advantage. The farther away the effort is from the fulcrum, the easier to lift the load. Another supplemental resource we created is called a voyage log, and it'll be a printable PDF that's available for parents to print for their children for when they go to the mill. And it'll just give a more story adventure uh, feel to all of the exhibits at the mill. So there'll be a map that has all of our exhibits and um, a stamp page that each exhibit will have a stamp on it that once the child has completed the exhibit, they can stamp it in their book and it just um, adds a fun element to it, encourages them to actually do all the exhibits. And then there is a final stop, which is the Miller stamp of approval, which will encourage people to actually go into the mill and do the tour so they can see how the principles that were in each exhibit are actually applied inside the mill. So another piece of uh, supplemental material that we've created is the teacher's guide and lesson plan. This is to go along with each of the exhibits that we've created. So it goes into detail about the uh, educational value for each and it explains the, um, the uh, engineering principles for each of the different exhibits, such as, you know, like Mackenzie said, mechanical advantage, gear ratios, wind density, stuff like that. So in creating this, we took uh, into consideration the max curriculum frameworks for uh, each of this. So th this guide partic uh, particularly is aimed toward children between, between grades six and eight. So everything in this can be used for teachers on the island or in different schools so they can have field trips here and they can show the history of Nantucket on and also teach uh, engineering principles through simple machines. And so now we're going to move into um, some of our future recommendations for our exhibits at the Old Mill. Uh, we actually created five designs for different exhibits and our first recommendation is to do some further work on fabricating and building uh, that fifth design that we created. Our fifth design is kind of this survivor-esque gear puzzle with three different sides where users can go up to each of the three different sides and they'll have that box full of different sized gears and they'll be able to put the different gears on the different pegs and only the right orientation of the gears will spin the different windmills at the top and it encourages um, you know, interaction between your friends, family, siblings and gets a bunch of different people crowded around one um, central interactive exhibit. Um, and it's really fun, but that's one of the things that we recommend that the NHA further implement after we leave, and we'll be pro um, providing them with those detailed SOLIDWORKS drawings and instructions that we had made for the other exhibits as well. Our second recommendation is to further open up the discovery room in the Whaling Museum to exhibit um, the interactive simple machines that we've created. The discovery room in the Whaling Museum is a really cool interactive um, space outside of kind of the central candle room factory. Um, in, the, in the Whaling Museum and you can have some arts and crafts or guest speakers there and one of the things that we've been working with the NHA on is making sure that all of our designs are portable and that can be transported into the Whaling Museum in the off season so that they can be exhibited when the mill is not running and that there is still an opportunity for STEM education um, at the Whaling Museum using these simple machines. And our next recommendation is going to focus on improving some of the interior and exterior signage at the Old Mill. Uh, we noticed on our tour with one of the interpreters that there were so many really cool details and elements of the Old Mill. And we thought it would be really interesting if those were you know, highlighted or labeled so that visitors can look back at them. Maybe they miss something the interpreter said and they can clearly see, oh, here's the stone puller. That's that really weird object in the corner there. Or that's where the hopper is and you know, the corn feeds down through there into the corn chute. And what is that huge vertical beam right there? Oh, it's the grinding shaft. And they can easily locate and pinpoint all of the different elements of the old mill so that they're easily identified. Another recommendation we had for the NHA is to utilize social media a little bit more. In this day and age, people are always on their phones. Uh, social media is a really big part of our community. So we figured if you're going to go to the mill and kids are playing on their phones anyways, why not use that to our advantage? So we were thinking create an uh, 
Snapchat filters and Instagram posts where people can send pictures of the mill with this fun little uh, graphic on it to their friends to encourage them to come. The NHA could also use these uh, social medias to post when the mill is operating and if events are going on. So if, they're, if it's running today, they can post a video on Snapchat and share it with all their friends so they can see it to know to come down to see it. So in summary, we plan to give everything that we've created to the NHA to provide the groundwork for a truly world-class kind of a um, museum exhibit experience. Something that's, you know, fun, educational, safe. And these are all things that we took into consideration while designing each of our exhibits. And uh, so we just want to give a sh huge thank you and shout out to everyone who's helped us since we've been here on Nantucket. A special shout out to our professors, Scott and Fred. You guys are awesome. Definitely a amazing, um, huge big thank you to James, Ed, and Mary, our sponsors of the Nantucket Historical Association, and everyone at the NHA who helped us along the helped us along our way. Whether or not it was just saying hi to us in the morning, or really just the NHA welcomed us into their family, and we're very appreciative of that. And it made um, working on this project really awesome. Thank you to the Nantucket Yacht Club for housing us, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Thank you, you guys, for hanging around. I know six uh, presentations can get a little bit weary sometimes, but everyone had really cool projects, and we just want to thank you guys for coming to our project presentation day and listening to everything that we've done for the past two months because everyone has worked really hard, and we're really appreciative for the community welcoming us to Nantucket and coming here to hear us talk. So thank you. We'd also like to point out that we brought some of the exhibits in the back, so um, during the Q&A portion or while you guys are kind of milling around at the end, we brought that gearbox uh, exhibit in the back. Uh, there's a crankshaft in the back, so feel free to give it a crank and really make it spin. You can pull up that rope and shift the uh, different cage gear into a different gear ratio, and you can really see that the speed changes. And we also brought the uh, our small mill in the back, and you can take the sheets on and off and kind of like feel how that experience is and give it a turn. So feel free to play with those and interact with those in the back. If you guys have any questions, you can ask them now. I, I think the, uh, the waste team may have a, an obvious answer to, to this, but mm -hmm. or at least they made it obvious at the beginning of the presentation, but what was the most fun aspect of this project for you guys? Was it the, uh, the, the work with the uh, saws yeah. just getting back to the roots of engineering or what was it for you? Yeah. So the question was what is the most fun thing that we had during this project? Then I know like personally I can say that working in the um, NHA's carpentry shop and the workshop there, that was probably one of the most enjoyable experiences as well as just kind of like being at the mill and like like I know Ben and I had a really cool time like raising the different like sailcloths and that was really cool because like when are you gonna do that? Like you'll never do that unless you're you know, working with the NHA and, and spending time with the old mill. I have to agree, the building was definitely really fun and the, um, like the voyage log stuff was all made on Photoshop. I thought it was really cool that stuff that I hadn't done in a long time, but classes, like I took woodshop in high school and I did Photoshop, like a lot of graphic design classes in high school and I thought it was funny how I was able to use all these skills that I hadn't touched upon in so many years that they got to be like brought up again in this project, but also just the relationships that we've like formed with everyone at the NHA has been really awesome. I thought it was really cool that in college, basically everything they give you, they kind of tell you what to do, the final grade this versus this, we had to come up with these exhibits, completely starting a project like that. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with uh, Mitch on that one. I think, I think yeah. the fact of just creating something that was totally original and having it actually coming to a final project and looking like going through the entire design process from even if you look at like our sketches on one of the slides it's like the original sketch is just totally different from what we actually made uh, like especially in the the box of gears in the back so i think it was really cool james so uh yeah, i'll <laughs> you just don't get my office for another little yeah. uh, But um, a, a question. Uh, it was interesting on your last slide where you brought the, uh, the four items out and you put them in situ. Uh, what, what did your gut tell you for uh, like what's a critical mass of interactives of the bill? Um, you know, 
Size. I think that the five will be good. Um, just thinking, so when we were discussing field trips and stuff, when um, teachers take classes to the mill for field trips, they usually only spend about a half hour there. And when we actually focus group some of these exhibits, we found that they held the children's um, attention for about five minutes. So having five exhibits, like I feel, lends a good amount of time and it'll be about 25 minutes that they'll be you know, playing with these things, and then they'll do the tour inside, and I feel like that's pretty much a good amount of time that people spend at the mill. So I think five's a good number, but definitely you could always make new exhibits that you switch in and out, and stuff like that. I think with that too, a big part would be seeing in May or whenever you set them out, just kind of focus, group the, focus grouping the first few groups there and see if they just quickly run through row five or if like spacing them all out, if they spend a lot of time or if they just you know, quickly go to a couple of them, whether or not you want to have more or not, can definitely be seen after you test them a few times. Yep. Question me, um, yeah, I will put to the disability. So in terms of designing the, you know, hands-on thing, mm -hmm. um, were you able to try to make it so that it's accessible to, to all, or, you know, how do we address that issue? Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that we kept in mind. Um, one of the things that we kind of thought about, thought through the process of is like, what if something is too heavy for someone who's maybe younger or shorter to lift up? And kind of, we, we realized through play testing it how easy or hard we could make it. And we've made some of the adjustments accordingly. Um, and I think that's definitely something that the exhibits might need tweaking on in the future, just through more exposure, through different like different situations, we can't account for all of the situations for all of the exhibits in the the seven weeks that we are here, and that's definitely something I think that the NHA should look forward to um, testing in the future because maybe they are fully accessible and maybe there are some tweaks. And the tweaks, um, I think we've set up the good framework to be able to execute some modifications to account for those along situations. With Along with that, too, for the dis disability stuff, too, um, we made a video tour of the mill where you can interact with the different sections of it, and kind of like the Housing and Tuckett did, where you can go through and see. So that's another aspect we can give to the NHA, so that way, along with the exhibits, they can see the inside of the mill if you're unable to make it inside. Thank you everybody for coming. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for giving some uh, relationships as well with parents of uh, students and back in the next before I have uh, taken this presentation, whether you know it or not. I think the students, uh, I can only say Scott and I are incredibly proud of you.